Welcome to 1991 Movie Rewind, a podcast where we watch and review every movie released in 1991, from the all-time greatest classics to the critically panned and everything in between. We will rediscover forgotten fan favorites and uncover hidden gems as we explore the depths of direct-to-video. Join us in our celebration of the fun, unique, and diverse films of this highly underrated year. This week, we watched He Said, She Said. This is John, and thank you for joining us on 1991 Movie Rewind. He Says, She Said is about two local TV political commentators who are also dating and living together. Dan Hansen, played by Kevin Bacon, is more conservative and afraid of commitment. Lori Breyer, played by Elizabeth Perkins, is more liberal and looking to marry. During the latest episode, Lori throws her mug at Dan and storms off set. Now each person gets to tell their side of the story. Screenplay by Brian Holfeld directed by Ken Quapis and Marissa Silver, and released on February 22nd, 1991. Have you seen this before? Yes, I've seen this. I have not. <laughs> this is a... It's been a, a while, but yeah, I remember watching this. It, it's uh, It'll be interesting to see how your... I'm assuming you saw it as when it came out, sort of like most yeah, of the when this podcast. Yeah, if it was... It was on HBO, so I remember that. And, you know, my mom really likes romantic comedies, so yeah, I was watching this with her a lot. But I haven't seen it since I was maybe a teen. So what do you think of it now? Does it hold up to you? Was it still enjoyable? It was about the same. Okay. (laughs) (laughs) Like, I, I remember thinking it was fine then and it's fine now yeah okay (laughs) i don't know it's to me i was like okay this is maybe trying to be another when harry met sally type of thing i think so i think it's hmm. what i what i keep thinking about is that it comedy doesn't age well in terms of movies, right? It's it's really hard to make a comedy that lasts. I mean, yeah, the this ages. movie really wasn't that funny. It's just about their love story. Yeah, even that has some whatever. But <laughs> okay, <laughs> I, mean, I don't know. It's I, interesting. I yeah, I, I think I think people who probably grew up with it would have better attachment because of the nostalgia of it. Um, uh, yeah, I know. I didn't absolutely love this movie as a kid. I just remember watching it, and then I I like Elizabeth Perkins. Yeah. So I think her I like, and then I think I just and then that was it. And then the story was fine. I wasn't really obsessed with this movie like others, <laughs> I guess. Right, right. Not it's nothing like when Harry met Sally no. to me. No. Which I I feel like this kind of wants to be like it. Yeah, I I think it definitely does, especially like at the very end where the, I, I I know we're some jumping like way at the yeah, end. I know. like we're way at the end when like the landlord couple are like on the couch yeah, like that's saying how, yeah, cuz they the they interview or yeah, they interview yeah, like on Harry Met Sally when they're interviewing like older couples about, you know, their lives and yeah. whatever yeah <laughs> that's maybe makes me think of that yeah it's just um when i was looking through the credits for this movie and what these people have done in the past or or since it made a little bit more sense so i'm gonna sort of skip ahead and, and talk about the writer brian holfeld okay. um to talk about how i think you know my perspective so this was his debut movie and since then, he's done almost exclusively kids stuff. Hmm. So he's done, like, uh, a lot of Winnie the Pooh stuff. So he did, like, Piglet's Big Movie. He's done some My Little Pony. He's done Transformers, Rescue Bots. He's done a Rocketeer cartoon most recently. Um, and he has, like, you know, daytime Emmy nominations for those things. And that made me sort of realize that 
Yeah, a lot of the humor in this movie, while not geared towards kids directly here... Was childlike? Was childlike. Meaning it's like... Okay. Something usually isn't funny if you hear it more than one time. You know? Unless you have an emotional attachment to it. Like, I could Mm -hmm. watch Billy Madison, and because I grew up with that movie, I can still laugh at it, even though I know all the jokes that are coming. If you've heard a lot of these jokes before, or seen a lot of these situations, they're no longer funny. And maybe these things were funnier back in 1991 because they weren't overused the way they could have Mm -hmm. been overused 30 years since. But it seems like a lot of the situational comedy and the performances especially with someone like nathan lane's character it's very much harking back to like the 1950s style Mm -hmm. of like comedy and situational stuff that i've seen a bunch Mm -hmm. but put that in the perspective of a kid's show where they don't have that history (laughs) you know those types of jokes would land and so it makes sense that he's like finding success in the kids realm Mm -hmm. if he's like sort of taking these attributes and then pushing them off into i don't know i hope what i'm saying is making sense but i think that's why it it wasn't so effective for me because it felt like a very much like a direct ripoff of like a 1950s or 60s movie but it didn't modernize the humor enough so that like a okay like an older romantic comedy yeah, like it was trying to be a screwball trying type of thing. Trying to be like a whimsical sort of thing. Right. Okay. But then like the jokes were the same. Yeah, the, to me there were no jokes, but to me this is just... It was just, trying to have a lot yeah, of jokes. Yeah, I, I think it was, there were certain parts where, I mean, if we want to get into it, like when they're in the restaurant and... They go to dinner, and mm-hmm. this this isn't even a date. It's just the, yeah, it's like a pseudo date. Yeah, they well in the movie, you know, the two they're two journalists. Um, they're up to become editor for the Baltimore Sun. Their boss is like, you each have to write an article, and whoever we pick is for gets this the job. gets the job. So. They write their article, and then after they're both done, they're like, hey, let's go out to dinner because one of us is going to be out of a job, so let's just have, like, a last hurrah thing. Mm -hmm. So at the dinner, Elizabeth Perkins, who's Lori, I should say. Either way. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) We bounce back and forth all the time. So, and then... I don't know why this even happened because they're just two colleagues going to dinner, but you know, they show her ordering from the menu and it's like, I will order the monogamy with the side of marriage and some kids. And you know, Kevin Bacon is like freaking out over Mm -hmm. that. And I'm like, this isn't even a a literal date. Right. (laughs) Yeah. That's like, but that's trying, I know that's trying to be funny, but to me, I'm like, Okay, yeah. I yeah, that really was, <laughs> those sequences were probably the most creative. They're creative, of, and I'm, they're probably meant to be funny, like, 30 years ago. Yeah, yeah. To the mindset. Like, I, I'm trying to think, like, you know, maybe this is a, quote, date movie, and then the woman drags their boyfriend or whoever to see this. Yeah, and I mean, then it was released 10, or, you know, <laughs> almost 10 days after Valentine's Day. So, so uh, it was af- yeah, afterwards. It was after. Um, That's what I'm, like, this is, like, one of those typical movies where it's, like, you know, the woman wants to watch this, and the boyfriend always has to be dragged to see these types of movies type of thing. Yeah, because they go with that same type of, like, gender stereotype non-stop in here yeah like um, kevin bacon is a typical man that doesn't want to commit ever and blah de blah he can't say i love you he can't he's afraid of saying i love you he's afraid of commitment and he has to have his way and the woman is you know strong and independent but not too strong and independent and there's all kinds of like weird 
mm-hmm. stuff like that. But yeah, I mean, those those fantasy sequences are what made the movie semi-interesting, and they should have been there more frequently. Because, yeah, it's, <clears throat> it plays out like a very normal scene, and then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, it'll switch gears and become this fantasy thing. And I think yeah. one of the, the great aspects of what Ken and Marissa did as directors is that they did not do what you would typically see in a lot of comedies in that they would like change the lighting or they would, you know, make things look a lot different to indicate that it was fantasy. Mm -hmm. They just played it straight with the camera um, and everything. And and so it became off-putting and and unusual and interesting that, yeah, they're having dinner and all of a sudden it goes into this fantasy sequence where you look at the menu and all all it has on there is like marriage or monogamy and stuff Mm -hmm. like that. But they didn't do that enough. And some of the times when they did it, it was like, oh, I want to go outside. Why don't we stay in today? And then, like, it's it's yeah, him. Yeah, the ball and chain. Yeah, you know, literal ball and chain. And, like, the locks are And then doors all these people, he's themselves. looking out the window and it's all these people saying, hey, come on outside today. Yeah, look at all this fun. Hey, Dan, it's nice out. And all it is is like, we should probably stay in today. And he feels like that's like a trap. And then like his he mind should. goes into that. I, don't, I mean, he could have been like, I don't, I mean, whatever. I don't know. It's a weird sequence. But it, <laughs> yeah, I don't, I'm just like, if if he wants to go out, he can just be like, hey. Yeah, it's like, oh, I, I can't play go basketball because I have to be Do you mind if you. I just go out to, because it's a nice day out. Do you, I mean, I know you want to stay inside, but can I go out? I mean, do you, I don't know. Yeah, I. Just commu- I guess communicate like, and then he's like, "Oh, I can't." But he doesn't say because my girlfriend wants to. But that's what he's thinking, and that's what this entire fantasy situation makes it think that he's being bogged down mm-hmm. because she wants to stay in today. Yeah, and Which he is- has to do what she wants because he probably thinks, "Oh, I want to make her happy or whatever." Which is, you know, very played out. Right? Yeah, it's, it's very dumb and it's very played out and it's very much like an old school mentality that's being presented here. And that was part of my issue, I think, is that, you know, there was a little These bit of creativeness, like but it wasn't, it wasn't, it wasn't stereotypes presenting. of what. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. It was presenting something uniquely, but it wasn't presenting anything interesting because it was old jokes. It was old yeah, the, yeah, I'm. I understand. The, this is probably something that should have came out fifty years ago instead of thirty years ago. Is Maybe, what, yeah, or even sixty years ago. Yeah, but it, I mean, it, I guess it's tough for me to say because you know, again, somebody who's seeing this thirty years ago, we have all this history of of film and TV now mm-hmm. that where all this stuff has come out a whole bunch more, and I, you know, I whatever i'm gonna (laughs) we're just like recycling the same type of points um the other problem that i have with this is that the movie is just too long for me yeah this is it's a pretty long movie it's almost two hours hour 55 that's when you said do you want to watch the (laughs) The director's commentary director's commentary i was like no i don't want four hours of this no another two hours yeah yeah, so we didn't. I'm end curious up that. because you know I like Ken Quapis. I, yeah, as a, a yeah as a director, he's definitely done a lot of good stuff. He's um, he actually has a Student Academy Award from 1982. Okay. Uh, and then yeah, he's, he says Emmy nominations for The Office, Malcolm in the Middle. Um, he's done a bunch of popular yeah. I mean, TV he's done shows. like Freaks and Geeks. I mean, yeah, Freaks and Geeks. Larry like Sanders. shows that I like, and. So I just, I like, when I saw Ken Quapis, I was like, oh, Ken Quapis, I know him now. I mean, I didn't know him then, but. Yeah, he's when a I talented saw... and well-respected comedy director. So I was like, okay, cool. He also did Follow That Bird. That, I, I mean. Which is cool. I love Follow yeah. <laughs> When I was younger, I, I, liked, I, I, I used to love too. that movie growing up. Yeah. And that movie, there's like parts of that movie that makes me sad. Yeah, <laughs> I, don't know. I mean, but that's you know that's that's par for a lot of the good Muppet stuff. Um, 
anyway, but Ken directed it. He didn't have a hand in writing it. And so that's where I was like, oh, okay, well, Brian Holfeld, he did a lot of kid stuff. And this has sort of like that. Like they both know. did. They went from kid stuff, like Sesame Street. Yeah. <laughs> to Well, sort this. of reverse, because Brian did this as like his first thing. And then he went kids. Ah. Uh. Yeah. So. Um, meanwhile, Marissa Silver didn't do like anything much in terms of directing she did a couple movies uh, but nothing after 1992 um she's married to ken by the way yeah um, yeah i don't know if they were at the time or not but now she's a best-selling novelist now she writes books. i think they were dating and then got married after this movie okay i think the one thing i would have liked to know from the commentary is who directed which segments Oh, uh, oh! Do I you mean, know that? he so he directed all of Kevin Bacon's That's story, what I assumed would have and been she true. directed all of Elizabeth Perkins' story. Okay, okay. So that's what I assumed would have happened, but it would have been interesting to see if they would have switched. Oh, like Ken Quapas do? Yeah, the do female all of Elizabeth part? Perkins stuff. Maybe, maybe in a remake. That that would be how it goes. Um. So uh, we're kind of getting away from the plot side of things. <laughs> <laughs> we're um, all over the place. But yeah, we're... Um, so yeah, the movie starts, they're in a TV studio. Um, they are, you know, political pundits, basically, giving their opinions on this highway merger. And then, um, yeah, she's, like, stewing in her anger while he's giving his opinion. And then, to, like, just, she's had it. She throws the mug at him and, and runs off. And then, like, the flashbacks start to show how their relationships have formed and how yeah, they got how, to this point. how it got to this point, why is she so mad with him that she had to throw a, a mug at him on live TV. Yeah, because at that point, we don't know if they're dating. We don't know that they're yeah, living together. Yeah, we just know we that... We don't know if they're married, if, if they're... They're two whatever. co-workers. <laughs> yeah, we just know Giving their thoughts on this highway merger. <laughs> So we get the we get the scoop, and it starts off with uh, Kevin Bacon's side of the story, um, which probably goes on longer than Elizabeth Perkins's part, if I had to guess. Yeah, um, because that just begins the entire story, and then her side was just going back through key areas of their lives. Yeah together so in kevin bacon's part they yeah they they have like the the newsroom meet where like she's doing weddings he's doing obituaries and then they get the call or whatever and then yeah they compete for it they do that dinner that we talked about already um although in elizabeth perkins's version of the story she denied him dinner mm. right and kevin bacon's he said uh she asks him out to dinner yeah. And he says yes. In her version, he asks her and she says no because she has plans and she breaks up with the dude yeah. and happens to come across him. Yeah, and at then the table she, after breaking up with She breaks her up boyfriend. with the guy that happens to be at the same restaurant that Kevin Bacon is at. Unless he was following her. Yeah, I don't I don't which know. Which they don't clarify. Um and then after the dinner they have their first kiss after uh, her contact pops out randomly while walking down the street. That confuses me because that happens twice to her. Yeah, once at the end to kind of like tie everything in a bow. Yeah, like, oh, my contact fell out again. Yeah. And I, I was like, do contacts really fall out that easily? I don't know. I, I don't know. I've never worn contacts. I have, and they've never... Like, I've heard of them, like, slipping out of your eye. Yeah, like, that has you know, happened to me. the back where, of your eye. Yeah, I've had that um, happen where it goes to the back of my eye. But I've never, like, walked. I'm not randomly walking down a street and then all of a sudden the thing comes out of my eye. Right. <laughs> like, the only way for it to really come out of your eye is if you're doing, like, someone, like, blows into your eyeball or something. I don't know. I mean. I was like, how loose are these contacts? 
Yeah, so it's tough for me to say if anyone was wearing contacts yeah, if in any... 1991. <laughs> yeah. The, the other thing that I was thinking of is, you know, like maybe there's a difference between hard and soft contacts because this one does crunch when he steps on it by mistake. I, so this I was had, a hard contact. I had hard contacts in high school. So, and those things, they pretty much stick on your eye. I don't know. Whatever. So, yeah. <laughs> the, We're not going to talk about the no. logistics of it. All I know is that she wouldn't have wanted to put it in her eye anyway, even if it was found, because those sidewalks and streets were super wet. Right. I mean, you can disgusting. hold it but and put it like in a... Yeah, they were expensive, right? So <laughs> she wants it back either way. Right. You can just put it like in a little piece of Kleenex or I don't know, whatever. Yeah. But anyway... She loses her contact, and then, like, shortly after he crunches it, it leads to their first kiss, and then she laughs at him. What I thought was interesting is that in the Elizabeth Perkins side, the Lori side, Mm -hmm. they omit that scene. They go to dinner, Mm -hmm. right? They meet at the dinner, but then, like, what she shows as her first kiss with him is them going to separate cars at that one point. And it's a much more romantic version of things. I forget exactly what the situation was, but it wasn't after that dinner. I don't think. No. I think it was a different day altogether. So it was interesting that they omitted what he saw as like a key point in their relationship. Like a kiss and then a laugh. And then she doesn't even have that part. So. Um, but anyway... Right after they kiss and she laughs, they see the paper being delivered to find out who won the contest of whose article's getting published. And surprise, it's both of them. Right. Which we knew. And then they're going to call it He Said, She Said or whatever. Yeah, they call it He Said, She Said. And so they become semi-popular newspaper people. They get their names on buses and pictures on buses. And then that transitions into a TV thing. And so that's basically how they end up uh, doing what they doing what they do but most of that is driven by um kevin bacon's character dan because she's she wants to remain a newspaper lady she wants to have the integrity she wants to be you know a new york times writer and he wants the fame and fortune he wants he wants the notoriety and the the popularity she's just doing it for him because you know she loves him and then i think they're just I don't know. Now I'm thinking, like, does she... Because I know they... She says I love you to him, Mm -hmm. but he doesn't really say it to her. Yeah, he does not say it back unless... He says it to her when she's sleeping. Mm -hmm. But yeah, she's... I think she's just doing it because she loves him. Yeah, we never see... I mean, it's not like they say I love you to each other a bunch, but like... Even when we know that they're living together and it's been like a three-year relationship yeah. up to the point of the mug throwing. Yeah. Like, he still apparently has never said I love you to her. You know what I mean? Like, it, yeah. that's, what it, that's the impression I'm getting. Yeah. Which is stupid and ridiculous. Um, but, you know, typical macho man. I mean, she says, she does say, you know, I love you, but you don't have to say it back. Well, yeah, as a defense mechanism. I know. <laughs> um, but yeah, they show several different scenes that are different from each other. Um, if we want to get back to the timeline of things, I guess, because I do want to talk about the play that they go to, which is like the next <laughs> scene. Yeah, their first... Their um, first joint assignment. Yeah, their first joint assignment is to go to this weird performance art dance play thing yeah like this sexual interpretive dance i forget what it oh it's called words without lips i wrote it down <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> words without lips <laughs> so it's like and this... it's like one of those typical arty performances that yeah hyper pretentious yes it's that's like... like the funniest part of the movie is this, yeah and this then dance performance i thing. mean the funny yeah because it's funny because, you know, when they show, because they show, you know, his side, Dan's side, and when they show Dan's side of the story, it's all of, like, the man, the man, like, strutting his stuff, and then, like... And they're both, like, they're laughing like at it They're, like, emoting. Together. No, but the dance 
that oh, the, the dance itself, the yeah, dance it's itself is grunt. very masculine, masculine, yeah. and it's like grunting, like ugh. And yeah. then they're like, the people that that are dancing together are like, as if they're like having sex, and then the guy is like, you know, grunting on her. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and yeah, they're laughing at yeah, it, <laughs> which I would laugh together. at it yeah. too. But then in Elizabeth Perkins' side of the story, it's very womanly because it's the female side of this dance where it's a lot of sighing. It's like, ah, like that type of stuff. Yeah, and she's, you know. And it's a lot of swaying. And (laughs) And she imagines herself in that position. Yeah, and then Elizabeth Perkins imagines herself in in that dance. She becomes the dancer, literally. Kevin Bacon, Yeah. yeah. And then she kind of gets emotional and starts clapping so yeah. there's like no they're not laughing about it in that part but exactly so yeah there's there's weird differences between that of course and that's sort of like the main theme of this movie right is like that there's differences but i definitely wanted to make sure yeah, we yeah. talked about that dance yeah their first assignment yeah and then they like go to a, a nightclub and have a drink together whatever okay um, this is where the nightclub is <laughs> Like, the, these nightclubs that people go to in their, what, they gotta be, what, like, th- early 30s? I guess so, yeah. It's definitely, like, an adult person nightclub type of a thing. It's like, I don't know. Like, I'm, like who, I'm just, because... But, like, people always it's look like older a, in these movies yeah, now, though. I know, even... They could, all, they could all be in their 20s, but they look like they're 35 just because of the fashion and the hair at the time. I, but I'm just... This entire whole club baffles me because, I mean, maybe, I mean, now that we're, like, five years older than what this demographic is, mm-hmm. I don't know. And I didn't do these things oh. <laughs> five to ten years ago. Like, go to, maybe I did, like, once to go to, like, a jazz club. But I'm not, like, the way that these people are dancing, it feels as if it's, like, a corporate it's like what people do after work. Yeah. They're like, hey, let's go get drinks and go to the club. But it's a not, you know, like a literal dance club. It's a jazzy, like, s- quote, swanky type club. Right. Where it's kind of, you know, quiet-ish. Like, there's areas where you can talk or, or and then you can go to the dance floor and dance to, like, this weird-ass jazz music. Yeah, it seems, again, sort of like what you would see in, like, the olden times of, like, the 30s through 50s, in that sense. Except it's more of an open dance floor and people who are actively trying to hook up. You can see that yeah. that's sort of Yeah, and then I'm like, who is hanging out at these jazz clubs? Yeah, I don't know. I don't know how much of a thing it really was or if that's just, like, a TV and movie trope that they took advantage of. I don't know. But yeah, there was a dude in like a semi, I don't know, like almost like a disco suit. Yeah, I mean, so it's like, did the people from the disco era grow up and this is like how yuppies, right? (laughs) The yuppies party by going to the jazz club. Could be, could be, I don't know. But yeah, um. She sees and then the sky. we yeah and then the mu- the jazz music that is played throughout makes me laugh. Was that the no that wasn't the blah 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 moon song. No, it wasn't played at the club, but they played no. other jazz music throughout this movie. Oh yeah, yeah. Including the blah 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 song, yeah. which I don't know, I kind of like. <laughs> I don't when it comes to like that type of jazz I jazz like, I mean, you know, because we've gone to restaurants where they play that, and it's... It's hokey. Yeah. Yeah. I'm like, and then when when we hear it in a restaurant, I'm like, who is this for? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Not yes. us. Like, we're talking about, at one point there's a song, by, which I think is even called Blah Blah Blah. Yeah, it's called Blah Blah Blah, and it's by Dr. John. Dr. Which... John performed it, but I think it was by the Gershwins. Okay. I think the Gershwins wrote it, so it's like an again an older okay, standard an older song, song, but Dr. That was John. remade and sung by Dr. John here. So even back then, I think it was meant to be 
you know, obviously comical and humorous when the Gershwins wrote it in the 30s. So I just there's like, different that layers. type there's of music aspects. I am so baffled by. I mean, it's <laughs> but yeah, it, throughout the entire movie, it's basically again New York Gershwin jaunty music, even though they're in Baltimore. You know, yeah. Like, is it just because it's a city that they have to like feel the need to do this? I wonder. I mean, does Ken Quapis have? A connection to Baltimore or anything like that? I don't know. Just, I I, I know he did He's Just Not That Into You, which I don't think you've seen. I have not seen. No. Uh, I, be, I mean, that's another type of movie that, I mean, that's from like 2009. And that's a movie that is another like, I don't want to say he said, she said, but it is. It's like. From a male and pe- female's perspective, multiple on, perspective yeah. movie. Yeah. yeah, but that also takes place in Baltimore. Like sliding doors, alternate realities. Well, it, it's not alternate <laughs> reality. It's just, just like multiple situations and relationships on the men and women's side of things. Okay. But yeah. Anyway, the music is weird. Yeah, it's weird jazz music. Uh, scored by Miles Goodman, by the way, who has a Golden Globe nomination for Little Shop of Horrors. We'll see him a couple more times. We got What About Bob and The Super. He did both of those. Okay. He also did Teen Wolf and K9. Huh. So, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so they go to this club. Um, she sees a person who... Uh, is like an ex of hers or whatever and she's dancing alone and he, and she's like if this guy comes over and asks me to dance can you please just dance with me instead he tells dan she tells dan like please dance with me instead so i don't have to be with this guy yeah and because he doesn't want to dance with her he yeah he doesn't want to dance at all he's too he's too much of a man's man to do such things right yeah it's, a, it's above him so anyway it happens and she they dance, they do a slow dance together, and they become more enamored with each other or whatever. They make out on the dance floor, and then now he only wants to be with her. Um, so he visits his flower guy the next day. Yeah. <laughs> Which was... Had the potential to be an interesting scene. Like, the flower guy scene was interesting because, like... Okay, so Dan is, like, you know... <clears throat> what's what's like a lothario right yeah like, you know he so he has like all these different women that he's pursuing and sends flowers to all the time yeah he's like dating multiple women but they all seem like it's they're okay with it mostly except for the one well, at except the very there's beginning there's scene. one in the very beginning that comes in looking for him saying where's dan and that's how wants to break his stuff and yeah. he's hiding underneath elizabeth Lori, desk. yeah Lori's desk and she's trying to like help him out but not really at the yeah. same time yeah that's a nice directed scene with like the perspective of him looking up at her and yeah. she's looking down at him and everything so that's um but yeah anyway so he says they only wants to put in one out order of flowers and the flower guy's like trying to like talk he's like him only out of one in love. Yeah. yeah he's like oh no you're not falling in love are you like i'm like i gotta feed my kids basically you know like it's that type like, of thing like, like dan hansen is the only guy that's paying for all his flower like his business yeah because he's he's that much of a a lover boy or whatever so it it had a potential to be an interesting scene um but yeah anyway and then okay there's a lot of like jumps and timeline stuff oh sorry we forgot to talk about Lori's perspective of the club scene didn't we yeah her perspective is that it, the guy that interrupted her and Dan to go dance, she kind of paid him to interrupt yeah. them. It was all her setting the whole thing yeah, up. She they had set, never met before. Yeah, they never, yeah, she set it up and it wasn't an ex boyfriend, but it was just in her Dan's way to... story, it made it, she made it look as if. Oh, there's this guy that I used to date. He's over there and he might come ask me to dance. Can you dance with me if he does that? Yeah. 
And then that's basically the difference. <laughs> yeah, she just paid him to do that. She's like, hey, I'm going to be over there with that guy at the bar. In five minutes, can you interrupt us and ask me to dance? And I'm going to decline. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so here's like $5 or something like that. And I think maybe it was after the club. That's where the first kiss happened, like the version of the car. Oh, okay. That might have been where that took place. I didn't write it down specifically, but I don't know. There aren't a whole lot of other like scenes where they show vast differences in, in what happened there's mm -hmm. um there's the whole thing about like looking out uh breaking the window right where she supposedly like sleepwalks yeah she sleepwalks and and talks he has in like sleep. night terrors and so he like wakes up with like night terrors and epiphanies which is like when he realized oh you know he's he was in bed with linda played by sharon stone who we haven't talked about at all yet yes um <laughs> And, and breaks up with her because he has this, you know, overnight epiphany that, oh my god, I'm in love with uh, Lori. Lori instead. Mm -hmm. And so he wakes up and has this epiphany while with Lori. And Lori's sleepwalking, saying that she wants to go get some cheesecake. And then, you know, he realizes that, you know, she won't remember anything. And that's when he confesses his love and that he never wants to be apart from her. Yeah. And he can't say that while she's awake for whatever reason, because that would make him too weak, or what? Who knows what? They don't really explain. Yeah, they don't. They don't get into his emotional stuff. Yeah, this is just a movie where it's like the man cannot show emotion. Yeah. They even have the puppet therapy scene. Yeah. Which I thought was going to come back in some way, or like. I don't know, there's a scene where he goes to see a therapist who he evidently is being is seeing like on a regular basis and they make it seem like Lori's also going to be there at some point or that they're, they're going to do like couples therapy or something and the therapist is like we should do puppets mm -hmm. this is what works with other people and again it's supposed to be like this stupid joke scene but it's something that's that very, we've seen like that's a million another times. like child like, that's what they use for children for therapy yeah. type of thing. Yeah, a lot of times they do it for children. But it's, you know, again, it's like, it's not, I don't know, it's it's not a new joke. And they didn't add anything to it. It's, it I don't know. it's a scene that definitely could have been removed, especially since we never saw Lori's version of puppet therapy in this whole mm. movie. Um, I will say that Lori's version of when he tells her that he loves her while she's sleeping yeah i like that part yeah i do too but it still is a little bit confusing because if she is legitimately a sleepwalker then like at what point did she wake up to hear those things she pro I don't, she probably, because she sits up and she's like, oh, I want some cheesecake. Do you want cheese? Well, he gets up because he has a night terror and then she gets up. Yeah. And she's like, I'm going to go get cheesecake. Do you want cheesecake? And he's like, yeah, yeah, go ahead and get cheesecake. But she goes back to sleep. Yeah, she goes back to sleep. And that's when, <laughs> that's when she com uh, confesses her uh, he love. says, I love you. I, I never want to leave you or I never want you to leave me. And then in her version, she wakes up again and says, I'm going to get some cheesecake and actually walks out to the other room. And then she, and then she like kind of down. cries a little because, yeah. you know, he actually confesses his love to her. Yeah. Yeah, there's some good moments in this. There's some decent... I don't know why they're together. I mean, I'm not going to pretend like I can understand why she decides to like start going with him in the first place, knowing who he is and how he and why she puts up with this. For well, so it's long, kind of like still. an opposites attract type of story. Yeah, I suppose so. But again, they don't really dive too much into the emotional side of things or the rationale behind things. It's more about here's this scene we're going to show this collection of scenes and now we're going to show the collection of scenes again in a slightly different way and they don't really get into you know the character building of it i don't know um although 
it, it, so with the fantasy stuff, which doesn't happen as much in Lori's side of the story, they do sort of build in this whole thing of like what what's the truth, right? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, even just from seeing some of these scenes from the different perspective, we can assume that probably Lori's side is the truth because mm-hmm. it seems more grounded, it seems more realistic. Um, especially like uh, that opening scene, not really opening scene, but like the scene where they're competing for the article and the boss comes in and says, okay, I know that you were, I know that Lori, you were promised this article and then I promised it to Dan, uh, separately. So we're going to have you compete for it. Yeah. Like in Dan's version, the boss is like sitting at a desk and just offering that dialogue very, very matter of factly. And then in Lori's version, the boss is like behind Dan and like rubbing his shoulders and like, you know, basically like giving every indication through his voice yeah, and manners. He's and saying, saying, this is my guy and you're yeah, screwed. Yeah. They say, may the best man win. And then they're like, oh, or, or woman. woman. And yeah, very different cadence and delivery in some of these different versions, which is, which is good. Um, but still, yeah, it just didn't. It didn't explain why either of them were really with the other one. Um, one thing I did like, though, is like when they did the transition from the he said to the she said. Okay. Right. So, um, oh, by the way, the movie starts off like the like this again, sort of like sixties, fifties sort of animation, right? With like the <laughs> to the, me, the printer looked... paper and like the. The notepad with like the, the uh, scribble. It, to me, it looked like some eighties, nineties word art type. Yeah, of it's like a deal. clip art. It yeah, looks a like clip, clip art, but type of. Thing. Just like the the animation and the score was very, you know, like what you'd see in the sixties, and then you have like the uh, vignetted circle around the he said mug, which opens to the the actual shot of the movie, mm-hmm. right? So, um, again, that's very old school and so then they do the same type of thing in the she said where they you know do the vignetted circle around the she said mug Mm -hmm. and then expand out to explain that this is Lori's half now um and then we're right back in the beginning of the show where we have the tv segment again but now we see a different performance yeah it's it's not just repeating the same dialogue the performances are legitimately different Mm mm-hmm and she, you can see how much more emotional she is and how much more cold he is being. Because they're doing this debate on this highway merger, which didn't make sense at the beginning, but now you can clearly see that it's a metaphor for their relationship and their marriage as a couple. You know, talking about like the union of these two roads that she's in favor of and he's against. Yeah. And because he's against it and she's trying to like, you know, that's her breaking point. Yeah. So it was interesting that they had that. I thought that was really well done. But then they kind of ruined it at the end. <laughs> to me, I don't know, to me. Because they just took the highway metaphor really far when they had to, when they were doing like their last show. Mm-hmm. And they're saying, okay, before I get into this new topic, I just want to go backwards and say, I, I, I've changed my position on the highway and like they're being very clear about like I think we should break up or I think we should be together or whatever like they just hammered it over your head so I think I got distracted from my original (laughs) I'm looking at the outline that we have here Um, the concept of like what's the truth and what's not okay because I was talking about that for a second I just kind of got sidetracked somehow um who do you think is telling the truth? I don't know. I think they both, it's like a, they both are telling a version of their own truth. Yeah, because you can see that there's some things that are just so drastically different between the two different versions. But there's no way to know who's exaggerating at what point. Right. Well, yeah, they can pro. he could be exaggerating at certain areas while she could be exagger- exaggerating in others, you know. Yeah. And I guess the other thing is... They don't 
tell us the truth. It's just what we think. Yeah, there's no third story of here's what really happened. It's not right. Like a, this it's is not like a clue. clue <laughs> We're not. Yeah, this isn't like a clue ending where oh, this is what really happened, but it was over like random small things. Like oh no, you were the one that broke the window. Right. Because you were sleepwalking, or right. you had your night terror. But she says she, she does not sleepwalk, which was kind of supported by her flashback to the I love you scene, and the cheesecake scene. I mean, because she woke she up and said... She could have been thinking that the whole time. Who knows? Yeah, we, we don't know if she is a sleepwalker or not. Yeah. Does it matter if we know the truth? I, I don't... Probably not. No. No? Like, yeah, I think it's just the... The concept of, yeah, everyone's going to have their own version and the truth is going to be something that's in the middle. Mm -hmm. Or a combination. I think that's probably part of the point. Um, although I will say that even though I'm on Lori's side for the most part throughout this whole thing, yeah, when she tried to saw the VCR in half... <laughs> I don't know. I mean, you know, when that's people get... That's a no-go get... for me. <laughs> When people get, like, irrationally mad... I know, but it's with VCR. Leave it alone. She's not gonna... How are you gonna watch... How are you gonna watch the video version? How are we gonna watch Cape Fear on VHS <laughs> if the, VH, the VCR is broken? I mean, this is early 90s. She can just get her... Those are expensive DVD player. DVD player. No, you can't in the early 90s. That's not till late 90s. Anyway. Um, should we talk about Linda real quick? Yeah. Because she's sort of an integral part to the story, but we haven't talked about her too much. Um, a lot of the issues that they have in their relationship st stem from the jealousy that Lori has for Linda, again, played by Sharon Stone. Um, we'll see her in four more 1991 movies, so it's really not worth going over her credits at this point. Um, she is Dan's ex- she evidently moves out of town at some point. Um, but then shortly after the breakup and the mug throwing, which is the breakup, by the way, in mm -hmm. case we didn't make that very clear, um, Linda is back in town and whatever, trying to get back together or whatever. And, and um, uh, Lori always had this I thought in the back of her head like that very... Dan was trying to leave her for Lori. Or I leave, think leave her for, for Linda. Linda. I th thought that she just she seems. I didn't know that they were exclusively dating. They feel like as if they're just like friends with benefits. Linda and Dan. Yeah. Yeah, at least at the time that he broke it off with her. But he was at the time that he broke it off. He's like, I don't want to be with anyone other than Lori now. But he was also dating other women. Up until that point, yeah. Yeah. But Lori including, was only jealous of Linda including, because of who she well, was. Because Linda is probably the one that he was the closest with right. out of all the women that he's been dating. Yeah, they make it sound like in this movie, I think... But I never really thought that they were teenagers. like exclusive... Because he's dating other women. Mm-hmm. Including Sharon Stone, Linda. Mm -hmm. But Linda seems as if, you know, she's okay with it. I feel, I thought they were just like friends with benefits. Yeah, no, I think Linda was okay with the situation. I think that the whole thing where Dan wakes like up he, in the pool of sweat is like yeah. him realizing, oh, I don't want to be with multiple people. Yeah. I care about Lori too much that I'm going to be with her only. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, that's. But then, you know, Lori has the fear in the back of her mind that, that he's going to go back. Time that he's yeah, he's going to go back. Like he, she it's knows that they are now exclusive and that they're living together and they should they should only be with one but another. But I thought, I mean, after the breakup and Linda comes back for some whatever reason, she works for the company that wants to buy the TV station that their he said she said segment is on something like so that. So I thought she came back just for like work purposes not to be with him and I think she's just friendly with him. Yeah until she knows that they're broken up. But I thought she just seems like a very flirty person in general that you know. 
Yeah, maybe we're talking about two different parts of the same series of events. So, like, when they're in the restaurant together. Yeah, I... And we're, we're talking about the talking to, at the end, right? So yeah. So, they're at the restaurant together. At that point, yeah, it's just, like, a friendly thing. Yeah. And, you know, she had heard about the mug throwing. I don't think she even knew about the breakup. Linda hadn't. Um, and was just there for, for mostly business purposes. Um, Lori knew that Linda was coming to visit because she had seen some piece of mail that Dan had not told her about. And so she assumed that Dan was going to sneak behind her back and try to get back with Linda. Whether or not that's Linda's intention doesn't matter. But I don't think Linda wanted to get back with Dan, like, ever or at all. Until they get to the hotel later. Right? I think she's just like, hey, you want to have fun? Just like, you know, f- like the good old days or whatever. That's what she starts to say. I don't think say, she, wants, she, to, say that like, she wants, be, wants to be more. Literally be with him. She does say that she wants more than just the fling. Okay. So, I don't know. Maybe I'm remembering it wrong. Maybe, I don't, maybe, maybe I, we have a he said, maybe she we said have right our own he this. said, she said. Um, Nathan Lane we talked about very briefly in the beginning, but he's like the producer of the TV show. Yeah. What I didn't fully understand is that, okay, when when all of this goes down and, like, Elizabeth Perkins, like, runs off and she talks about how she's going to, like, quit the show altogether, he's saying that, you know, you got to, you know, he's saying, like, Mark the cameraman or whoever it is, I forget, the, the guy that Anthony... Anthony Lep- LaPaglia, yeah. yeah. I don't remember what his role in the TV station is, if it's cameraman or what. Um, that he needs to go fix this or whatever. He's kind of just like the gopher because he... I guess, yeah, a production assistant of some kind. Because even when we can go back to Linda again, when in yeah. Lori's side of her story where Dan and Linda are just talking at the restaurant that that's the restaurant that they first went to it was that italian yeah, that restaurant. was their first date quote unquote yeah and she driving around like she was gonna go home or something and then and happened to see them poor Marked anthony in. lapaglia yeah. is just like following her her right home and they happened oh to see he her. gave her a ride home yeah i thought she because was because her keys she was were like, inside and she didn't want to come back and get him even oh, though okay. he was gone i, I thought know. she was like you have to come with me type of thing no no um so he drives on by she sees them at their restaurant yeah and so he convinces her to go into the restaurant and pick date. up some food to spy on them and yeah, figure out what's going on yeah but i mean he's just kind of like bumbling along with her yeah but um, what I found weird is that Nathan Lane was basically saying to, like, Anthony's character that, you know, you have to save this because, like, you know, you may not have a job tomorrow. I might not have a job tomorrow. Which I thought was really weird that, like, they care so much about this thing when it's, like, a very short segment on a new show. Like, you see that highway I... debate and it's, like five minutes and yeah, they're done. Yeah, I thought it's... And they're clearly at the corner of a news set. So this is, like, a news show... Yeah, it seems like it's just, you know, like it's the not evening like, news or something. Yeah, it's not... Yeah, that's why I was... I'm like, why would they get rid of the evening news? Yeah, why would it matter if, like... Unless they're getting rid of that channel or right. something. It's not going to affect his entire job. He's Like, if he only produces that one segment, they're going to give him another segment. You know, like, they're, they're, there's more news out there. He's not... So, anyway. I mean, is he it's in charge like a, of that segment only? And if that segment is done with and nathan lane is done with as well i don't know it just didn't make any sense as to why he cared so much about that situation because he wanted rating they Other wanted than, ratings for this news show segment i think they just thing. wanted the madcap character i think they yeah. just wanted to have like a goofy frantic guy that they could throw in there and like that's what nathan lane does yeah. you know like he if you've seen nathan lane and stuff he does the same shit here. Yeah, this is, <laughs> he the this same is like my introduction to Nathan Lane, and it's been pretty much the same. Yeah, and we'll see him again in Frankie and Johnny in 1991. Oh, wow. Um, I mean, he's been 
nominated for Emmys for all kinds of I stuff. I mean, no, I'm not like. He's, he's fine for what him. he is, but yeah, he's very. Uh, he plays like the same he character. He does the same much. stuff every time. Um, it just didn't make any sense that, you know. They didn't need that subplot. I think with the whole thing, yeah, like, with Mister weird... Weller, who needs to co- who's going to come and like possibly buy the show or take it to the next level. Like they don't need that subplot mm-hmm. at all. So weird ending, weird structure, way too long. They could have <sighs> cut a bunch of stuff off, and that's my summary. <laughs> okay. Anything else we missed on the plot side of things that you can think of? Not really. I mean, they got they pretty much got back together. Yeah, yeah, they get back they res- together. They resolve everything. They sort of realize they they want their highways to merge. Yeah, and they, and they do this on camera. Nathan Lane is like, "Let's yeah. show this." It's like, "Oh, we should of- let them have their privacy." Oh, but the boss man will like it. Oh, get the cameras on him right now. Yeah, it's like and, that the, sort and of that's like- how it ends. It's like, "Oh, let's watch these two that usually fight." makeup yeah and then like the very last shot is like the landlord couple on the couch watching the talking TV about like saying, whose side did you take so who, yeah who won that argument it's weird weird um all right real quick we can talk about other casting crew that we haven't talked about so far okay all right so uh we talked about, well, we talked about Kevin Bacon and Elizabeth Perkins. Uh, we'll see them both again in another 1991 movie, so we can talk to the, get into them more at that point. Um, Kevin Bacon's going to be in Queen's Logic, he's going to be in JFK, and he's going to be in Pirates with his wife, Kira Sedgwick. Uh, Elizabeth Perkins is going to be in The Doctor, um, so we'll see her again. Um, but I forgot that she was Wilma in the Flintstones movie. Oh, yeah. Completely forgot about that. Anyway. Um, Anthony Lopaglia we'll see like three more times too Sharon Stone we'll see more times so a bunch of these people we're going to see again and we can talk about them in more detail Um, a couple people I do want to talk about is like sort of like a pausing on the credits type of a thing Okay. one Michael Harris played Adam who was the boyfriend that uh, Elizabeth Perkins' character broke up with at the restaurant Okay. I only want to mention him because he was also in Slumber Party Massacre 3 (laughs) <laughs> which is like a sort of a, a favorite of mine i like that series so anyone who's part of that movie franchise deserves a mention um charlene woodard played cindy who was one of uh laurie's friends who helped her like get rid of his stuff in the apartment yeah there's so many characters in this movie who do nothing i i was like how who is this friend yeah, they don't like explain, a neighbor or they don't explain their relationship. They have like a couple lines of dialogue with each other, but she's, it's like there's Cindy she's is pointless. just like the one that just you know tries to give advice. Yeah, I guess. But then, like, also like the the landlord's wife is there, Mrs. Spepic. Yeah, uh, played by Rita Karen. Um, <laughs> the landlord, uh, Mr. Spepic. He's going to be in three more 1991 movies. We'll see him again. Um, Phil anyway, Leeds. Phil Leeds. Uh, Charlene Woodard, by the way. So she's in One Good Cop in 1991, uh, along with Anthony Lopaglia. Um, but she's also a playwright. Um, she's done five different plays, mostly solo productions, like mostly you know, like one-woman productions. But she's gone on to be a successful playwright. Um, and she continues to act. She's in Pose. I don't know if you recognize huh. her in Pose. I forgot to write down her character name. Uh, she did a stint of in Days of Our Lives around this time. She was in Unbreakable and Glass. So she's continuing to work and also, you know, good for her for writing the plays. Uh, and then the other person I want to mention really quickly is uh, at one point they're in a diner. And they get recognized by the diner owner as like being on TV. It's like the first time they're recognized as a TV couple. Yeah. Did you recognize the daughter? Because the deli owner's daughter, uh, Rita, was played by Erica Alexander. Okay. Who uh, got her big break on The Cosby Show um, and then went on to be in Living Single. Maxine. Mm-hmm. Okay. 
Uh, and then yeah, she was in. They were in that for. She was in that in this movie for like, uh, thirty seconds. Yeah, and maybe had like one line. And she's but like, I oh, recognize yeah. her right away. I'm like, oh, oh yeah. Look who it is. Yeah, and she's in Get Out. Yeah. Yeah, she's in Get Out, Black Lightning TV so- show, the Wu Tang American Saga thing that's coming through. Um, and then she also uh, has her own production company, Color Farm Media, um, which is doing a whole bunch of different stuff. And she's the co-writer of Giles, which is a comic spinoff of the Buffy the Vampire Slayer really? TV show, which is interesting. Oh, uh, and one last I would thing. Ask, I would have to ask my Buffy friends about that. I didn't yeah. know there was a Giles. <laughs> a Giles. Uh, there's a comic. I don't know how recent oh, it is. Oh, the comic. I yeah, mean, yeah. I haven't read. No, it's, I it's, have it's a some comic the... spinoff. Okay, I have the Buffy comics so there's one that's called guile or I giles i should say a I series think it's a series yeah sorry giles is like an inside joke <laughs> yeah if people who've watched buffy the vampire slayer they would probably know what guiles yeah, is that's true no awards talk to talk about so on to true crime pop culture yeah, I mean, I do not have anything crime related. I can't say I'm too surprised that there would be nothing like immediately related to this movie. Yeah, I don't have anything that. I mean, you usually I'll look up is this like based off of a true story type of thing, or what is you know crime related around this story, and you know there aren't anyone in this movie that did a crime or anything like that. February twentieth. 1991 just a couple days before this movie it was the 33rd annual grammy awards Mm. so that was like on a wednesday i guess which i didn't i thought grammy like i thought all awards were like on sundays yeah sundays are fridays but i don't i don't know if this was like a midweek thing 30 years ago but so first off, the awards were presented in New York. It was hosted by Gary Shandling. Hmm. Okay. The record of the year was Another Day in Paradise by Phil Collins. Okay. Album of the year was Quincy Jones for Back on the Block. Can't say I'm familiar with like either of those, really. Wait, you don't know Another Day in Paradise? Not really, no. Do you like, I knew like know Phil Collins, like not really oh i mean what are there other songs on that album that i should know i just know the song another genesis or like earlier than like 80s era phil collins i guess maybe because i used to work in a grocery store in the mid 90s so i know a lot of adult contempo music yeah i mean i also don't (laughs) typically know a lot of songs by title so if i but he literally has a song called another day in paradise i I understand but i probably i don't know if i heard it i might know it i'll play it we'll put it on the website we'll put on the website it's not that great actually but i'll comment on whether or not i recognize it. yeah okay it's not that great though okay um, so moving on, song of the year was from a Di- from a distance by Bette Midler. Okay, do you know that song? Not offhand. Okay, not by wow. name. All right, maybe by melody, but not by name. I'm not gonna sing them. That's I'll, fine. I'll I'll play it for you later. Bette Midler's in some sort of 1991 movie for the boys, right? Yeah, for the boys. Yeah. So the best new artist for that year was Mariah Carey. Yeah. Okay. And for best alternative, (laughs) this made me laugh. Well, I shouldn't say. I just like this category. The the idea. The idea of having an alternative category. So best alternative music performance was Sinead O'Connor for I Do Not Want What I Haven't Got. Okay. So best pop. Here we go. We can go best pop vocal performance was Mariah Carey for Vision of Love. So R&B female was Anita Baker for compositions. And then R&B male was Luther Vandross. Okay. For Here and Now. Do you know Mm. Here and Now? I do know Here and Now. Okay. (laughs) Best rap solo performance was MC Hammer for You Can't Touch This. All right. 
best rap performance by a duo was the this was on Quincy Jones album back on the block. So it was Big Daddy King, Ice T, Cool Mo D, Melly Mel, Quincy Jones for Back on the Block. Okay. Gotcha. Do you know that? Not 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 off the top of my head, no. We can I know those rappers. Yes. <laughs> but I don't know that song. We off can the top of my head. look these things up. But uh best rock vocal performance female was Alana Miles for Black Velvet. Okay. <laughs> and then best rock vocal performance male was Eric Clapton. Okay. For Bad Love. Alright. Yeah, I know. <laughs> We're like, eh. <laughs> So moving on to the top songs of that week. The top U.S. song was Whitney Houston's All the Men That I Need. Mm. And the top U.K. song, which we mentioned this back a few weeks ago for Sleeping with the Enemy, I believe. And that was the KLF Mm. 3 a.m. Eternal, and then I have an extra little tidbit about this album because I know I went a little off on it because I used to love the album yeah. growing up. So I follow, I'm going to do, be doing some shout outs this week. So the first one is this Instagram page that I, I follow. They followed us first, and it's called the 1991 Project, where it's. It's a guy who posts what happens every single day in the year of 1991. So, but he's going by, he's going chronologically. So, you know, this is April of 2021. So yeah. he's, so he's, he's talking about, from April of 20, yeah, of he's posting what happened in April of 1991. So I've been like, we, I've been using a lot of his stuff for information, too. Sure. So, this album was released in February of 1991, and on his Instagram post, that album, The White Room, it was... You know how I said that the album, to me, was like one long concept album? Yeah, yeah. So, I found out that... That album was originally conceived to be a soundtrack to a film that was going to be called The White Room. Oh, okay. And it was going to be about the KLF search for a mystical white room that would enable them to be released from their contract with record label Eternity. Oh, wow. Okay. So this sounds very much like... (laughs) The Apple or like BIM to me. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, wow. would, would this be like another version of that? Oh, I wonder if that's still in consideration for them. <laughs> no, I don't know. It, it also, he also gives information that the album's direction was changed and both the film and the soundtrack was canceled, but most of the tracks for the film were just used to make this album. So. I thought that was really interesting. (laughs) Thank you, 1991 Project. Yeah. All right, and then moving on to the top R&B song, it was CNC Music Factory's Gonna Make You Sweat. All right. And now I'm moving on to TV. I am not doing TGIF this week because it's pretty much the same now, but Mm -hmm. I did look up SNL and there was... Oh, there we got an episode. We got an episode on February 23rd, 1991. It was the 300th episode of SNL. And this would have been their 16th season? Probably, yeah. It was hosted by Alec Baldwin, and the musical guest was Whitney Houston. She performed I'm Your Baby Tonight, and then All the Men That I Need, which I just said. So some of the sketches, we probably... We should have watched it. Yeah, we could have watched this, because it's on... They're all on Peacock. Yeah, they're all on Peacock. And truncated versions, not full... Yeah, they don't show the musical performances. Yeah, and some of the sketches that have copyright issues, they... So some bypass, of these episodes yeah. are like 15 minutes long. Well, no, they're not that short. Uh, you know. <laughs> they seem like... Like if you... I don't know. They used to do SNL reruns on Comedy Central that were like an hour with commercials. It's sort of like that. I'm going to move on to actual 
shout outs, and then reviews. So I was in contact with some listeners that we recently got that were from New Zealand, actually. And I don't know if you noticed this because we got an email. I don't monitor the emails super closely. Okay, I do. So we got an email from someone from podstatus.com. And it said that our podcast was number 53 in the film reviews category in New Zealand. That's pretty, I mean. <laughs> it's interesting. For, for someone, to, like a podcast as young as we are, the fact that we're like breaking top 100 of any category in any country is like mind boggling. Yeah. So. And then I think it's because of these two guys that reached out to me and I said I was going to shout out, shout them out. I was going to do it last week. I forgot. And I think I forgot because last week we just watched a really bad movie and I was just so like annoyed. <laughs> we, were ready to be done we were like about done it. with that movie. So I'm just giving a shout out to Jasher and Hamish. They are two friends in New Zealand. They, their podcast is called Collect Any of Everything Podcast. And that's spelled C-O-L-L-E-C-T-A-N-E-A. We'll go to 1991 MovieRewind.com. We'll have the link. Yes. And then they're just two friends in New Zealand talking pop culture. And other stuff, like people have reached out to us like via Twitter or just online. And we've gotten a couple of reviews One of them, a friend of mine, which I'll I'll read, and then another one that I'll read was from another podcast called Late Fee Cinema Podcast. So I'm going to read the first review that we ever got (laughs) from a friend of mine. And thank you so much. Yes. A charming husband and wife with great chemistry takes a look back of 1991, a year unusually packed with memorable movies. By the way, I'm biased because I'm friends with the hosts. But you'll take my word for it, right? I mean, seriously, though, if you're a certain generation, i.e. ours, then this podcast is the lighthearted nostalgia trip we need in today's tough times. Plus, Nikki and John don't just look back on the movies. They also talk about random tidbits from that time ranging from pop culture to true crime. Does anyone remember a sitcom called Baby Talk? I didn't. (laughs) And if it weren't for 1991 Movie Rewind... The memory of it might have been lost for ages. Be kind and rewind. The next review that we got from Late Fee Cinema was Nikki and John are my new favorites. Love the vibe of 1991 movie Rewind. Watched their review or listened to their review on Double Impact and was pleasantly surprised. (laughs) Super professional and cannot say enough good things. So thank thank you. you. Yeah, that's fantastic. (laughs) It's amazing that anyone listens to us just in general, not not because I think we're bad, but just because it's like, you know, it's like us. Just... We're sitting here in our bedroom recording things and the fact that it's going out to anybody and it's reaching and, and you know, people are enjoying it. Well, thank yeah, you. I, that's amazing. It, thank you so much. Yeah, it boggles my mind that people in New Zealand are listening to us because yeah. I've never been to that part of the world. The power of the Internet. So yeah. Let's, let's give our own rankings and ratings now. Let's, let's talk about he said, she said, and where it ranks on your one to five star scale. Um, I give this a two. A two. I think that's probably fair. Um, translating that to like my zero to four star scale, I'd say it's probably like a one. Uh, yeah, I'm going to stick with one. I was thinking about oh. doing a one and a half. Okay. But I, yeah. And it's mostly because the directing is honestly really good. <laughs> like, it, it, you know, the directing and cinematography are, are up upscale. The acting's yeah, fine. Yeah, the acting you know is One great. and a half. One okay. and a half. Okay, one and a half. half. <laughs> <laughs> the acting's good. The directing is good. The story was too long. I think, or... like, the script or, like, uh, yeah. uh, the way it's wit- written. Yep. I, I think that was probably the biggest downfall, unfortunately. Um, but every movie's worth watching once. Would you watch it again? Yeah, I would watch it again. 
I'll might. watch it with the commentary maybe later yeah, on. Yeah, I'm think, curious yeah. about the commentary about that, what Ken Krapus would the, say. The only reason I would watch it is with the commentary, just to see what we might have missed, and we could report back if we do happen to watch it. Uh, but if you out there want to watch He Says She Said, as of this recording in April 2021, it's available on HBO Max, digital rental, VHS, and DVD. As always, check your local listings. As for us, you can listen to us on all of your major podcasting platforms. Please rate, review, subscribe, tell your friends, just like we just heard. Uh, you can email us at 1991movierewind at gmail.com. Of course, you can follow us on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and Letterboxd. Just search 1991 Movie Rewind. Or go to 1991movierewind.com for the full list of 800 plus movies, along with show notes and more. Next week, we're going to be watching FX2, which is available on Tubi, Pluto TV, Digital Rental, VHS, and DVD. We'll see you then. Thanks. Thanks.